So, so good evening, everyone. My name is Lil Stoller. I'm the program director at Jeff in Israel. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. It is August night or August morning for some of you. Um, well, some of you are still maybe in vacation or in the middle of vacation taking this call, so thank you. Um, some of you who are here tonight um, from communities where school have started and here in Israel, we are looking to September 1st. Today we will open our discussion amongst funders active in the social and the geographic landscape of Israeli society. Jeff and members, Adina Shapiro, who works closely with the Arab Israel Society, and Jonathan David, who is working to strengthen the Ethiopian community in Israel. They both will share with us their insights about now philanthropic decisions they made and didn't make uh, to address many needs of these communities. Um, but first, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gil Pereg, an educator, leader, and scholar who serves as CEO of Dark Education Network. Since its establishment in 2010 by the Rashi Foundation in partnership with Alliance Kiach, Dark has made remarkable progress in narrowing the education gap in Israel by providing over 22,000 students in the geosocial periphery with a high quality education, regardless of the background, religion, or social class. With the addition of partners, Youth Renewal Fund, Adelis Foundation, Osli Eli Foundation, Rowan Foundation, and other funders and Jeff and members, DARKA is a leading school network in Israel that strengthens communities and encourages social mobility. With a focus on STEM education, fostering a sense of responsibility for their communities and developing leadership, the 40 DARKA high schools use the latest pedagogical innovation to give students the skills they need to success in the 21st century. Under Gil's leadership, DARKA schools have reached 89 matriculation rate, well above the nationwide average of 56%, with 97 of graduates who continue to national service, pre-military programs, and IDF, straining the fabric of the Israeli society. Gil's academic background with peers from Northeastern University, touching on effective practices of successful principals in Israeli high schools and master degree in public administration from Harvard University, as well as the master of Jewish philosophy and law degree from Bar Ilan University, in addition to his expertise as a school principal, providing the expertise to lead us into this conversation today. So Gil, thank you uh, for joining us tonight. And we will start from saying that COVID-19 emphasizes some of the gaps in access to technology within Israel society. Although this topic was well documented in the media, it would be great to hear from you some insights on this matter. So Gil, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I wish we could have met in person, but at least we can see each other, and hopefully one day we will be able to meet in person again. As you were saying, uh, DACA is a network and organization that was founded in order to bridge the gap within the educational system of Israel. We're now the only organization that are trying to do this job, and one of the things that we have seen in the last few months that the gaps that we were dealing with and facing with and trying to fix are actually much wider than what we have even envisioned. Uh, as a network of schools, once the crisis hit us, we have transformed, of course, immediately to online learning, to remote learning. Gladly, thanks to the innovation that DACA was involved in, uh, the transition was pretty smooth. But unfortunately, what we have seen, and I'm sure we're not the only one, is that it's not good enough to have talented teachers using Zoom and other methods to teach the students. You need to make sure that, that someone out there at the end, at the end of the computer, at the other hand, that will be able actually to listen to you and learn from you. And what we have seen is that the gaps that you're speaking about are actually consistent of three components. The first one is pretty trivial, and everybody's speaking about it right now, is the technological gap, for sure. I was very happy to learn that the Ministry of Education is planning to provide thousands of computers and devices all around the country. It seems that it will take them some time, but we all understand that 
first of all, the technological gap is a huge gap. If you don't have enough devices at home, if you don't have a steady internet line, you can have amazing teachers teaching, but nobody will listen. And of course, in the areas that we work in, this was a major challenge. Um, and even though our principals are ready to instill immediately online learning, we started to get responses from our schools all around the country that many of our students cannot participate in these learning sessions. And for that, what DARCA has done, and I'm very proud of our organization for doing that, is that we were flexible enough, thanks to the support of our funders, and you mentioned all of them, and we are so grateful to them, is to be flexible and to shift immediately some of the funds that we usually use in daily routine for supporting schools to become a sort of a welfare organization. And we found ourselves providing thousands of devices all around the country in a few weeks. Uh, but honestly, this is not enough. The technological gap is not the only one that you need to overcome. The second gap, uh, which is even harder, is how to educate your teachers to do an excellent job using online learning. We all know that when you work with students who come from struggling backgrounds, you usually need to invest a lot in the actual teaching in the classroom to overcome these gaps. And for that, we try to recruit the best teachers to train them along the years and to give them the best practices available, the best methodologies to do an excellent teaching in classroom. But how do you transform it into being effective in teaching from remote is a huge challenge. And in the last few months, DACA has instilled a lot of programs and professional development training for our teachers in order to give them tools to be effective in such a setting. And the third gap um, is in many ways even more troubling. And I would call it the cultural gap. You know, all of us are now sitting in comfortable environments. I actually evacuated myself from my home because I didn't feel that it will be very effective to have my little kids dancing around me while I'm speaking with you. But you can all understand, and I think from our own experiences, that in order to be an effective learner in such an environment, you have to have enough space in your home, in your apartment, uh, to be doing that. It's not just about space. It's not just about device. It's about the cultural support that you need at home in order to do it. And in many of the families that we serve, unfortunately, many of the parents are not educated themselves and are not even necessarily highly motivated to push their kids to spend six, seven hours at their room studying. Many of the families were struggling with welfare challenges and they needed their kids to help them support the family and stuff like that. But we all understand that there's an importance to have a significant adult, a responsible adult, an educated adult at home, working with the kids, supporting them. All of us are facing it with our own kids. Um, and just try to imagine an Ethiopian family in Kirat Malachi uh, that are not necessarily even understanding how this thing works. How can they support the four or five kids to, support, to, to be participating in four or five different learning sessions? This is a huge challenge that I think everyone in education that is working in these areas, especially given the COVID-19 crisis, must take into consideration and create every intervention possible to support these families and, and these parents. Gladly, DACA has instilled in recent years, thanks to the partnership with the Israeli Foundation, a lot of programs in teaching and educating parents about what we do. We understood that it's not enough to work with the teachers and principals and the students, you have to work with the parents. And in regular days, we actually convene parents all around to come to seminars at school to try to explain to them the importance of what we do and how what we do with their kids will help them uh, break the vicious cycle of poverty that they live in. But how do you do it now when we cannot convene the parents? It's, it is not that trivial, it's not that simple, and this is something that we are continuing to struggle with and to find creative solutions to be doing. Hope it answers your question. Well, 
Yeah, um, thank you. Um, you mentioned, you know, school leadership. Um, how does the school leadership cop in this crisis from your perspective? And also, um, can you refer to DARPA's role as network in supporting the principals and staff during the past few months? And maybe a few words um, when we look on the next school year. So school leadership in our eyes is probably the most crucial component if you want to affect change in a school. Um, I'm actually pretty obsessed with this topic. I dedicated many years to research this topic, as you were mentioning, and we have built together with my excellent team and our board of directors, a network which is based basically in two things. The first component is budget. We wanna make sure that our schools are budgeted fairly in the same way schools in affluent communities are budgeted. And then for that purpose, for the generosity of our supporters, we can add, and we're adding something like 15% on top of what the government is allocating to our schools in order to level the playing field and to give our kids the same extra support that kids in Ramat Gan in Tel Aviv would get. But this is just one component. We have learned that money is not enough. If you don't have excellent leaders and managers and principals on the ground, nothing will change. And for that, we have put a lot of emphasis on recruiting the best principals available, training them, supporting them, backing them, because they are the headstone for any transformation you wanna see in a school. And I think the last few months to your question have taught us how the role of a principal is so crucial. And I know it's, I might uh, um, sound a bit critical to the, our Ministry of Education, but honestly, what I'm about to say is not directed specifically to the Israeli Ministry of Education. I think all around the world, we have seen confusion and ambiguity and mixed messages conveyed by the governmental leadership um, to the field, to the ground, to the schools. Just even look about how things happen in Israel. I mean, right after Pesach, we were speaking with our principals based on what the Ministry of Education was saying about learning in capsules and all that, when we build a whole system. And then one night, just abruptly, the government said, you know what, just bring in the students. Let's, let's learn again as normal. And then after a few weeks, let's move on to hybrid learning. So if you would wait for guidance, clear guidance from official bureaucrats of the Ministry of Education, you will be in trouble. And what we have seen at DARCA, and I think it was extremely effective for us, we have heard our principles and we have put all our efforts based on what our principles told us. And I think this is something not unique to DARCA. I think every effective organization in Israel that is running schools have based their um, capabilities and their actions about what the people on the ground, meaning the principles were conveying. The principles knew what was happening in their own community, understood the complexities and were extremely innovative and creative with their teachers. And I think this is something which is actually very optimistic that we can all learn from this crisis. Um, and one of the things that uh, keeps me optimistic is hearing and learning um, from the Ministry of Education, especially from Yoav Galant, uh, the newly appointed Secretary of Education, I'm extremely satisfied as my peers. I've spoken with the Secretary of Education several times on this topic, and I'm extremely happy to learn that he has heard this voice from the field, and at least they're planning, this is what they're saying, to give much more flexibility, autonomy, and, and tools to principals to be running schools. And if this is something that we will all gain from this crisis, I think we've, we've uh, achieved a lot. Because this is the only way uh, to move things. If the government will continue just to throw out reforms every two years and confuse the schools and will not trust the principles that we have to be running the schools effectively, nothing will change. And just to wrap up this point, as you were saying, we see our role as a network to support our principles and for them to support the teachers. There's a beautiful book I once read when I studied in the US. Um, the title is, if you don't feed the teachers, they eat the students. So your role as a leader is to support your principals and to give them all the backing and the resources they need in order to support the teachers and then later on 
to support the students. And just the last point on this topic, uh, and this is another thing that DACA is trying to pursue in recent weeks. We have been witnessing, not only in Israel, but all around the world, uh, a major shortage in talented people willing to become principals. There are many reasons for that. Um, I think the task of the principals these days has been uh, uh, become very, uh, very complex and, and stressful. And unfortunately, when you're trying to seek for talented people to become principals, what we've been seeing in recent years in Israel, that it is extremely hard um, to find people to take this position. What we've offered the Ministry of Education is to launch a, a special project in which uh, people from outside of the educational system uh, that are talented, that are devoted, that have uh, their heart in the right place, they love kids, they want to be involved in this task, will take part in an intensive one-year uh, learning, uh, uh, learning seminars uh, that will be uh, based on on-the-job training with principals. And this will allow really to increase this pool of talent and hopefully we'll have uh, much more talented people running our schools in Israel and maybe also outside of the country. Ruth. Thank you, fascinating. Um, we spoke this week on our pre preparation call about uh, you know, the transition or um, from not only uh, working with, with education this, in these past months, also doing things of welfare and how you can touch the, or see the child in this uh, uh, very challenged situation when everyone is at home and you don't meet him. Um, so maybe if you can describe some of the challenges uh, that I think that will, will follow with us to the next school year of the social distancing uh, from your perspective and, and how we can deal with that um, very big challenge. Yeah, um, thank you for this question. So I think that there's a trap in online learning that we have to be aware of. And this is a tendency, since this is a very um, challenging uh, channel to be working with kids, many teachers and many schools can find themselves focusing mainly on teaching core subjects. They want to make sure that their kids will pass the exams, especially in Israel with the tension around the Bagrut. Uh, so we will find teachers finding ways to teach math uh, effectively, sciences effectively, maybe English effectively. But what about all the other aspects of education that in regular days, uh, we try to put so much efforts in doing so. At DACA, we believe that our role is really to help our kids become the next citizens of the state of Israel committed citizens, contributing citizens, students that are um, educated with notions of the importance of democracy and inclusion and values and Jewish values and humanistic values and how you make sure that even when you're so far away from your kids and you cannot take them to museums and you cannot take them to field trips, that you do not neglect uh, this extremely important component of education this is something that I think every educator these, day, these days should think about, should dedicate time for that. Uh, we at DACA even instilled some uh, gym tracks uh, via Zoom, which is kind of hilarious to watch, but at least the message is there. Uh, you, gotta get your, you gotta take yourself together. You gotta move yourself. Uh, you gotta take care of your health. You gotta take care of your family. And there are so many aspects other than just knowing how to uh, solve an equation uh, which are part of education. The second thing um, is how to really instill an environment of support and uh, empathy and inclusion and warmth in a time that we are doomed to be so far from each other. And I think every educator these days and every teacher misses the opportunity of being in the classroom, in the building with the kids, being next to them, being able to see them, to smile to them. This is the best we can right now is to see each other, but we all understand how important it is for human beings to be with each other and think about, again, kids in the areas that we serve and other organizations are serving. In many cases, 
and this is something that we have learned along the years, there is a chance that the first meaningful adult that a student will ever meet is their teacher in the classroom. And I've heard it numerous times from students saying, saying to us, the first time somebody was there for me, caring for me, uh, listening to me, supporting me, was my teacher that I met in 10th grade, 11th grade. Now, how do you do it when you cannot meet the, the child? How do you do it when you cannot go and visit him at home as we uh, do on regular days? So again, this is something that we're trying to think about in creative ways how to do it. Honestly, our job is to do it with our principals, as I was saying earlier. In regular days, we convene our principals every six weeks for a full day. They come together, they speak with each other, they schmooze with each other, they laugh with each other, they gossip with each other, they share their grievances, their failures, and also their successes. And we are there for them to support all of that. But we cannot get them together now. Um, so how do you create a, an emotional supportive environment in such, a, in such a setting? Of course, it's very challenging. We have put a lot of effort in trying to find creative ways in doing that. I can't say that it replaces fully the actual meeting, but I think we've had some very meaningful sessions of gathering of principles. And from them, I'm learning that part of these techniques are now used uh, in the classroom. So hopefully to your question about what is waiting for us in 13, 14 days in Israel, um, the truth answer is that nobody knows. I mean, again, speaking of ambiguity and uh, mixed messages and confusing messages. We've been hearing different messages in the last few days. Um, it seems to me, if I need to make a, a guess, I would say that Israel will shift probably to a hybrid model. I'm guessing that high school students will probably be going to school maybe a day or two. Again, depending on the town and the village and the city and the status of the COVID in their environments. And younger kids, probably kindergarten kids, will be able to go fully into, into, into the school. Um, we are preparing ourselves for a long time uh, to be operating like that. We are explaining our principles that um, they need to prepare themselves at least for another year like that. I'm hoping I'm not too pessimistic, but uh, I prefer to be um, conservative and prepare ourselves to this situation and then to be surprised uh, with good news than uh, just uh, you know, trying to imagine that in a few weeks we'll be back into normality uh, briefly. So this is what we are planning uh, to be doing. We've learned a lot during the last few months. Uh, we will definitely have a lot to learn more and we're speaking with many of our colleagues trying to learn from best practices both in Israel and outside of Israel. And hopefully all of us will overcome it and, and one day we'll be in school <laughs> again hopefully smarter and maybe using technology in a better way than we used to do prior to the COVID-19 crisis. Maybe your next thesis will be on COVID-19 and school leadership. Thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, for your insights. And I would like to take now uh, all the lesson learned that uh, um, we, we've heard from you and to take it uh, um, to the philanthropic conversation. Uh, so I would like to turn to you, Adina Shapiro, trustee of Bader Philanthropies, founder of Baderat Philanthropic Office, board member of JFN, fan, uh, JFN um, the Jerusalem International IMCA, um, and many other initiatives in both Jewish and the Arab sector in Israel. Um, so Adina, giving uh, all the lessons that Gil presented before us, as, fu as founder very much invested in the Arab-Israeli society, what role do you think, uh, as a funder like yourself, should we play in addressing these needs? So, for, first of all, uh, thank you, Gil, for for uh, for the very informative and, and vast uh, description of, of what uh, of what's going on, and of course for everything that you're doing in the field of education. And, and I feel that uh, in the in the world of philanthropy, and, you know, we we have to be uh, humble during this time, and we're one step removed from those that are actually working on the ground. So I can really speak more about our, our observations and and um, and what we what we what we see and where we see possibly our role can be. Uh, in terms of education itself, 
our interest in becoming involved in, in this field, which is something that we were less involved in uh, philanthropically, particularly in the areas that, that I am, because data philanthropy does have a full uh, uh, funding area of education outside of Israel, then uh, there, there are two main reasons that, that we see it uh, important now. One is that education is a big equalizer and the situation now is something that enhances the social gaps, if anything. And those that have, as you mentioned yourself, Gil, less access to, uh, to, to infrastructures, less access to, uh, to a cultural or, or familial area that, that can uh, accommodate uh, learning, it makes it even more difficult to, uh, to access education. So we find the marginalized society uh, societies are even more marginalized, and we see that even more with the Arab society in Israel, which is a, a group that I'm uh, more involved in uh, in funding uh, in funding here. Uh, in particular, I would even stress that in the Arab communities, you have infrastructures, municipal infrastructures that are weaker. The leadership is weaker. So, if you were speaking about the need to support educators and to support leadership, already you have. Uh, uh, um, communities that are, are less uh, that are less strengthened in the first place, so it, so it's it's more difficult. You also have more truancy and societies that feel more marginalized in the first place. So the social distancing through education and not being able to convene makes it even more difficult. And even the lack of availability of materials, educational materials that don't exist so much in Hebrew, don't even exist exist less in, in Arabic. So. So all of those things make it a, a really important time if we're addressing social gaps to also address this field. But another reason that it's important to us is that I see the emergency in the opportunity that, that's involved here. It's not just an, an emergency of humanitarian needs and the need to supply what's not there, but a time where we say the education system globally needs to adapt to the 21st century. And here we, we had a catalyst to take a leap forward and not a leap forward both in terms of technology and in terms of possibly some humility in the world and the concept that learning and teaching is something that goes across, that cuts across boundaries. It's not the classic teacher that's the teacher that has all the knowledge, but rather kids now have access to a lot of information and the, and the um, disruption of the world is something that has to change the, the entire concept of, of education, which is something that should have happened anyway. So we do have the opportunity, perhaps a little bit more from the lap of luxury of philanthropy to take a zoom out perspective and say, wait, it's not just the emergency needs, but actually to latch on to what's happening now and to be able to take it a step further. So those are two reasons that, that I find it particularly important to invest in this now for us. What roles we're taking are, um, are in, in a few aspects, I think. One is our role as a convener. We don't have the knowledge. The knowledge exists, I, I, I'm not, uh, many of my philanthropic colleagues do have the knowledge, so I don't want to belittle anyone, but the knowledge is on the ground. It's with the institutions that are working, it's with the principals, it's with the teachers, it's with the parents, it's with the kids. It's with those that, that are involved, it's with the Ministry of Education. And so our role is to be able to bring people to the table. And that's one of the things that we also see our role um, in Mubadarat when we're looking particularly at the Arab uh, community where we can call the, um, the ministry, other funders to come and sit around the table with us and learn together to try and see if we can maximize our impact. So, so that's, that's one area. Another area is our um, ability at this time to invest in some kind of strategic uh, thinking, planning to put funds into saying, A, in the short term, what are the low hanging fruits that we can identify and support in a way that we can uh, help and push them forward because the, the needs are so vast that for us to look at you know, multitudes of requests to make it quite, um, quite difficult to decide where we want to put our energy and not everyone needs to invest in the same place, but that's uh, one area. And the other, on the other hand, to take this time to be able to learn from the experiences of different uh, nonprofits, of different uh, foundations and what we're funding 
so that we can think of a long-term strategy together with the um, with the ministers, uh, ministries and the professionals in terms of how to take education a leap ahead or a step forward for all of the communities in Israel um, and also perhaps uh, globally. So th those are some general impressionistic thoughts uh, on my end. Thank you. Um... Um, we'll soon open this to uh, um, an open conversation. And uh, although I, I like the privilege of being the one that's asking Gil the questions, you all will be able to, to ask questions uh, um, and to share your thoughts. Um, if you can just please turn on your camera so we can have an engaging conversation, that would be great. Uh, but before that, um, Jonathan David here with us, Jeff and member, your foundation work um, closely with the Ethiopian community, with your holistic strategy to create an excellence program that produces top graduators um, who continue to successful military service and academic careers, promoting social mobility of the Ethiopian community. Um, so what from Gil's comments relate to your uh, intervention, intervention strategy as a funder of Leaders of For Tomorrow program? and the Ethiopian community, and please briefly describe your intervention strategy, um, if you can, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, so Gil, Gil did such a great job that uh, a lot of the things I was gonna say, he said, but I will echo, uh, I'll echo a few things because uh, I would say that uh, probably the, uh, the things that Gil mentioned probably apply that much more to the Ethiopian community than, than anyone else, given that uh, a, when you look at the statistics on poverty or on education, unfortunately, uh, uh, the Ethiopian community is in last place, uh, well, well behind uh, the Arab community. Uh, I would say that the Arab community has done a great job in recent years and just you know, it doesn't matter where you look, uh, but say in higher education, and if you look at say uh, the Technion, which is, you know, probably the number one uh, engineering uh, and, and sciences institution, uh, Ethiopians are underrepresented by a factor of nine or 10. That's even when you take into account what their percentage of the population there should be about nine or 10 times as many Ethiopians at the Technion as there are. And of course, you know, on the other side of the, of the spectrum, uh, uh, you know, by the time they reach the fifth or sixth grade, Ethiopian children on average are two years behind. And then they go into middle school and get even further behind. And, and then you get a lot of uh, delinquency and a lot of kids going in the street. So, that's kind of the general picture uh, you know, in terms of how does how has how do we intervene? Well, we we have, as you said, an excellence program. So we're we really focus on the very most talented kids, and we bring them eventually to the level of five units of Bagut in English and math. So really, the very highest level possible. And uh, how do we get there? It's it's a process, uh, and it, it's hand in hand with an empowerment program, which uh, basically you know builds up self esteem and self pride uh, in their own community and own heritage, and we believe in building that up first uh, as a as a first step before you can integrate. First, you have to have a solid uh, self-esteem and self-image. And, and that goes hand in hand. As Gil mentioned, you can throw all the money you want, but if you don't have the right people and, and, and you don't have uh, a cooperation with the family, with the teachers and, and, and bringing the students to a high level of self-esteem, then you know your money will go down the drain. So we've uh, been doing this for 10 years and we've uh, thankfully had a very uh, successful record and successful formula. Essentially, uh, we, we work with the parents to bring them uh, into, you know, rather than uh, the approaches in the past, which has been leave the parents behind and focus on the kids. We actually think that the parents have to resume their role 
as leader of the family, even though there's been a lot of breakdown of the family. But we, and, and so we're, the, the parents are partners with us. We have our supervisors are from the Ethiopian community. That's very important. Uh, so they're in touch with the parents and in touch with the schools. And, uh, and then the empowerment, we bring in successful Ethiopians to share their success stories and the challenges and how they overcome those. And that's a very huge uh, factor. So um, uh, that's a little bit about what we do. We, we, these days we start in the fifth grade. We used to start in the seventh grade, but as partners have come in, we've expanded. And basically in those middle school years, we work really hard to bring them up to the very highest level in math and English. Then we have technology summer camps. We have uh, many, many other uh, things that they're exposed to. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they're going into very significant military careers, being officers, being in the top units, and then on to higher education. So, uh, so far we've got, right now we have 220 students. We've got about a couple hundred graduates, and we have 130 Ethiopian engineering and medical students on scholarships. Uh, so that's a little bit about the background in terms of the COVID uh, well, the, the big impact, uh, the economic impact is huge. Uh, the typical Ethiopian family is uh, typically a mother is the main, uh, the main uh, person making the living. And that's two cleaning jobs, uh, bringing in four, five, six thousand shekels a month. Average six people in the home. Uh, so uh, when they, when she loses her job, we have a big problem. Anyway, the big brothers and sisters have to chip in to keep keep the household afloat. So there's always crises, and it's a very challenging situation. Um, so the so the COVID, of course, with people losing their jobs, just the economic impact has been huge. None of these people have jobs where they can work from home or work on on the computer. That brings in the second issue. A lot of times, there's not a computer at home. And uh, uh, if there is, maybe there's one. So how are you going, if you have five kids in the house, how are they gonna do Zoom school schooling? They're not, and that's what happened. In fact, during the lockdown, they simply didn't learn. So big problem. Uh, you can try on the smartphone if you have it, not, not so good. And then of course, as Gil mentioned, the environment, uh, not, not space, no quiet, no support. Uh, typically parents being illiterate. So uh, uh, again, the same challenges that Gil mentioned, maybe, maybe uh, you know, to the extreme. And um, uh, so, you know, we have, we have adapted by, during the lockdown, we did online learning uh, at hours that didn't interfere with school. And uh, since the restrictions were relaxed, we've done in-person learning in small capsules, and that's worked out very well. Um, so we'll see what happens with the school year. It's gonna be challenging, but uh, hopefully hopefully we'll be ready to meet that challenge. Um, thank you all. I'm sure like in one hour um, is definitely not, not enough to cover this, uh, uh, this topic, uh, especially in these days. Um, so this is a... Uh, uh, an open invitation to continue this conversation uh, with us, with JFN. Please feel free to write to us to share with us your thoughts and uh, any connection that you would like to have with the members who participate uh, and join our call. I want to thank our speakers, uh, um, to Adina, to Jonathan, for finding the time and the efforts uh, to prepare, uh, to prepare your thoughts. Uh, um, to this conversation. Adina, I know with you, it's only to push, you know, the play and, and you always give like interesting thoughts and, and input to this conversation. And Jonathan, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Gil, uh, thank you and to all Darkest team. I would like to thank the, um, the Jeff and member Mark Rowan and the Rowan Family Foundation, especially to Julia so well for helping to facilitate uh, and shape today's discussion. We hope you learned something new and uh, we invite you, as I say, to reach out to us, uh, to connect with members. 
and we would like to wish all the children uh, and all the uh, um, school education, uh, the educational staff who work with them a safe and healthy and fruitful school year. Uh, to Dada Ba. And else for all of you as well. Hello. Bye bye. Tada.